evening uh, tonight here at the Four Seasons. Um, we're thrilled to have you all here to join us and listen to Jim Knauss, who's a great speaker and has a wonderful message uh, to share with you today. Um, I'd like to thank a number of people here in the room. Um, Josh Zakum is with us this evening. I'd like to say thank you very much. And a number of our sponsors who helped make this evening uh, a success for us. We have Zen Associates. Uh, Peter White is here from Zen Associates this evening. Um, Zen worked with us on the restoration of the White Memorial Fountain, which has been a big success. And if you haven't seen it, please do walk by because it's just wonderful to see everyone have a chance to enjoy that. Um, we also have Tom Kershaw, our longtime friend and supporter from the <laughs> And Jean Bollinger from Weston and Sampson, who did a lot of work with us on the restoration at the White, is not able to be with us this evening, but I would like to thank them for all their help and support. Um, and probably most importantly, we have the Lees with us this evening, Henry and Joan, so thank you very much for being here. And I'd like to thank the Four Seasons as well for hosting us, so thank you. I am, and I didn't introduce myself, so I apologize. Um, I have met many of you, so, um, but I, my name is Leslie Adam, and I am the new Friends of the Public Garden board chair. And I am thrilled to be your new chair. A little intimidated, but really thrilled by this opportunity. Um, I am originally from Boston. I spent a lot of time away. I spent a number of years in London. Um, which was a city that really has a great passion for its parks. Um, and I was fortunate enough to live very close to Holland Park, where I spent a lot of time. Um, but I have very, very special memories of the common and the public garden with my mother over the years living here in Boston. It was always a very special outing to come and ride the swan boats and walk around. Um, so it feels like a tremendous honor to now to work, be working with this group and this board um, in these really important parks here in our city. Um, and I also feel as if we've done, we've been fortunate with all the work that, that uh, the Lees have done in leading uh, the efforts in the park, but there's so much more work to do. And I think that what happened this year uh, with respect to the shadow laws and the Millennium Project um, really brought that to the forefront for all of us. And we realized that um, we have even more advocacy ahead of us. And we think it's really important um, that we stay organized and vocal. Um, we were disappointed, obviously, that the law was changed because we thought it was a good law. Um, but. We felt in the end we did get some very, very important things um, for the friends and for our mission. We are able to, we have been able to focus on working with the city on a master plan for the Boston Common, which we think will be crucial. Um, we feel that we need a more formal agreement, and the city has been open to that. So, Although we didn't win, we feel we've won in many other ways, which will be important for the, the long good health of the, uh, of the common and the parks and uh, the public garden. So um, I want to thank you again, um, and I'd like to turn it over to our executive director, Liz. <laughs> Thank you, Leslie. Uh, Liz B is executive director. I think I may know all of you here, <laughs> which is wonderful. It's so great to see you come back. This has become an increasingly popular evening. I'm so glad that you want to come and want to be inspired and provoked. I hope Jim will both inspire and provoke us, because it's important for us, as Leslie, to say, continue to think about how we can do this even better, how we can challenge ourselves and the city to make sure these parks aren't just all right, but are at the highest level of excellence, which they deserve and need to be, given that they are our iconic central parks. 
and the most heavily used <coughs> parks in the city by a huge order of magnitude. It's been a thrill for me personally and for the organization as a whole that, that Leslie said yes <laughs> to become our board chair. It's been wonderful. She started on June 1st and we've been uh, keep, keeping her through her paces and with us, so it, it'll be a wonderful time together working on this. Um, you know, as uh, Leslie indicated, we didn't get everything we wanted from what went through Square, but with crisis does come opportunity. The idea and the need to have a plan for the common, the need to have planning for downtown so we're not addressing and reacting to one building at a time. The importance of having mitigation funding from the developer for the work that they will be doing. And the importance of having a, a formal agreement with the city, which was not part of the um, navigation of this process and, and the fight with Winthrop Square, but it's something that after 47 years, we feel that we need to have a formal structured relationship so we know what to expect of one another, that we're accountable to one another, ourselves and the Parks Department. Um, as you have heard over the years, and we still this year did, we spend over a million dollars a year in these parks. We could not do that without your support and your um, great commitment to the friends and to the work that we do. Um, we also had, as, as Leslie said, we completed that white fountain restoration. Every year someone says, what's the next new project? <laughs> Sometimes they're obvious and wonderful like a fountain. Other times they need to be quieter. But this one was a big obvious one. Uh, dry since the 80s. With your great support, raising over $700,000, being able to celebrate the water returning once again to the angel in uh, June, uh, and also planting a tree for our late board chair, Ann Brooke, and Anna's family came to celebrate with us as we, as we dedicated that tree in her honor, so that was a wonderful day for many reasons. We also completed an important campaign, the Joan and Henry Lee um, the Henry and Joan Lee, but it could be either way, <laughs> sculpture endowment, $2.5 million. And I want to particularly thank one of our leadership committee members, Barbara Hostetter, for the amazing work that you and Nina Doggett and Ann Lovett did in making this happen. Thank you so much for that. We thought it would be two years, but these women rolled up their sleeves and got to work, and it was a 17-month effort. We also had the um, help of our honorary chairs, David and Rosalie McCullough, and Ron Drew, great, great help with corporate giving. But that is work that we need to do in these parks forever. Every year we spend about $100,000 on, on sculpture, and $2.5 million will throw off at 4%, $100,000 a year to do the work that we need to do. In fact, this year, we spent $60,000 alone on the Channing Memorial, on the Channing Monument across from the Arlington Street Church. It doesn't look like it, but when you actually watch people at work, the months that it takes to do that work, painstaking work to restore the stone, to restore the bronze, and to restore the, the fence on either side. So if you haven't seen it yet, go take a look. There's also an inscription on the back of the stone, at the back of the monument, which faces into the public garden. You could not read the inscription before, so we regilded it, and now the letters are clear. Um, so that's wonderful. Go in and take a look. You may, some of you may have remembered that there was a, a, a subway entrance at that point. Then there's no longer a subway entrance. It's a wonderful restored monument. We enjoyed our sixth season on the Brewer Plaza, which has just been a wonderful transformative space in the common. We really reclaimed that for positive activity. This year we had two food trucks instead of one, which means that we doubled the income that we made to help offset the $100,000 we spent on that for a reading room and, and lunchtime piano playing and coordinators making sure that place is clean. You cannot find a place to sit on this beautiful summer lunch day which is just so wonderful, it, it speaks to of itself. We celebrated the 30th year of the Rose Brigade. Um, just an amazing accomplishment that every year these volunteers show up under the inspiring leadership of China Altman and now supported by Carl Foster. Uh, and in honor of that, we, we hybrid, had hybridized and named a China Altman Rose in her honor. And we had a, a ceremony and a, and a party there this summer, which was wonderful. We have a, a, a sister a, a spring, springing up from the Rose Brigade, the idea of a border brigade, to be able to, to care for the borders that we restore. We had 40 years of restoring the Boylston Street border and the public garden, but then being able to support the investment that we did there. We have a group of volunteers that have been doing wonderful work, and I think I see some of them. Chris Anderson is here. Thank you so much for that. Um, Marjorie Breville and Bobby Moore are the three 
leaders of that effort, and that will continue to get better as the years go on. We had, I think, five people show up the other day for our last Water Brigade. Um, it's taken 30 years for the, for the Rose Brigade to really be taking, and I think that one will catch up to it as well. We also have volunteer docents. They, they led over 500 people. Did anybody go on a tour this summer, a, a docent tour? No. Well, if you didn't and you haven't, you should go. It's called Untold Stories of the Public Garden. It really is things that you think you know, but you actually don't know about this place. So over 500 people were led by docents. And maybe I would ask for a show of hands. Who is either in the Rose Brigade, the Border Brigade, or a docent? Our volunteers. Thank you for that. And again, thank you all, our members. We could not do this without you. And I know you've been, uh, you come to see here Jim, so without further ado, I'm gonna introduce Jim. Jim Canales became president and trustee of the Barr Foundation in May of 2014. We in Boston are so fortunate that foundation co-founders Barbara and Amos Hostetter found Jim and lured him from San Francisco to Boston. Jim spent two decades at the James Irvine Foundation in San Francisco including service as president and CEO from 2003 to 2014. Jim taught high school English in San Francisco after earning degrees in English and education from Stanford University. Jim's volunteer engagements include service as trustee of the Isabella Stewart Garden Museum and on the advisory board for Harvard Business School's Social Enterprise Initiative. In 2015 to 2016, he co-chaired the Leadership Council of Boston's cultural planning process. Jim's writing has appeared in the Boston Globe, the San Francisco Chronicle, the Chronicle of Philanthropy, Stanford Social Innovation Review, and other outlets. So we very much look forward to hearing Jim's thoughts on the imperative for aspiration in shaping Boston's public realm. Jim. Thank you very much and uh, good evening. I was honored by the invitation to join you this evening, and I simply want to also acknowledge uh, my board chair, Barbara Hostetter, uh, co-founder of the Bar Foundation, whose vision, whose dedication, and whose partnership has been absolutely essential to much of what you are going to hear this evening, so I'm so delighted uh, that she could be here. I have entitled um, these remarks, The Imperative for Aspiration, because I'm persuaded that aspiration is an essential ingredient to ensuring Boston's status as a world-class city. We are already a great city, with many assets and resources at our disposal, but as I've come to discover, we can sometimes resist change. <laughs> as a city, and because of our many strengths, Boston can run the risk of being self-satisfied. Perhaps more damaging than that is that we are not immune from complacency. And as a result, we can avoid being as bold, adventurous, and imaginative as we should be and as we need to be. And I would say that we need to combat these forces in order to shape the public realm that our city and its residents and visitors deserve, much as we see in other cities around the world. And the best way to achieve this vision, I believe, is through the power of aspiration. This is especially true in our ambitions for a great public realm in Boston, a shared concern for all of us in this room. It is what all of you have helped to do as part of our city, but we must build on that success. And if I could make a request, I don't think it needs to be this dark. The slides aren't that critical. It's more of a pictorial representation, and I worry that it uh, made the room a little too dark. Um, and again, this is more to, it's not so much to focus on the slides as much as to just give you a little bit of a sense of uh, the imagery. So let me speak for a moment about the Boston Common. The Boston Common was the first such common in our nation, as you all know. And it stands as a centuries-old testament to the power of aspiration, of long-term thinking, of sacrifice for the common good. It is a treasure. But it, too, depends on our continued investment, creativity, innovation, and activation to sustain its relevance and power for our times and for generations to come. 
So while I'm a relatively new Boston resident, having arrived in 2014, just in time for this. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> I offer my remarks this evening from three distinct vantage points. First, I'm a downtown Boston resident who lives a block from the Boston Common and the Public Garden and who utilizes these parks practically every day. Indeed, the Friends was one of the very first organizations that my partner Jim and I joined when we arrived in Boston. We knew that these parks were an incredible amenity for local residents and we wanted to do our small part to support your important work. Second, I speak as a native San Franciscan who had the great fortune of benefiting from thoughtful planning for, for an investment in our parks in the Bay Area, in Golden Gate Park, the downtown waterfront along the Embarcadero, and in this image, Chrissy Field and the Presidio redevelopment, which was a tremendous success and which I'm going to return to a little later in my remarks. And third, I offer my observations this evening as a foundation professional, working on behalf of an organization that is committed to a great public realm for Boston, and that's where I want to start this evening. The Bar Foundation has now been around for about 20 years. Today, we grant $80 million per year focused on three core areas, arts and creativity, education, and climate. In recent years, we have broadened our focus beyond Boston to be more of a regional funder with targeted national engagement. But as we have done this, we retain an unwavering focus on Boston as our home city, and that's what I want to focus on this evening. We have also evolved much of BAR's work in recent years. Indeed, during my time with BAR, the one aspect of our work that has evolved most significantly has been communications. Increasingly, across our work at BAR, we are exploring ways to use our voice in targeted ways to elevate key issues, to help frame a public conversation, and to advocate in ways that advance our mission and support our partners. We are not alone in this approach, as many foundations across the country have come to realize that communications can serve as a powerful tool for impact in complement to grant making. Tonight, I want to describe one particular initiative at BAR which unites the theme of aspiration with the tools of communications to advance an ambitious, hopeful, and exciting vision for this city's public realm. In the past 18 months, BAR has invested over $6.5 million in an initiative focused on Boston's waterfront. Our interest in the waterfront is a direct reflection of one of BAR's core values, to adopt a long-term view. Philanthropy is uniquely positioned to do that. We are not subject to the market pressures of delivering to shareholders, and we do not have to answer to an electorate. As a result, at our best, philanthropic institutions can embrace a long-term perspectives, and our work on the waterfront aims to do just that. We realize that there are market pressures for the waterfront in Boston related to supporting growth and development, stimulating economic activity, and encouraging job creation. And these are good things, and Boston must remain attentive to those needs. At the same time, we have watched how the waterfront has developed, especially in the Seaport District. Many, including Barr, have expressed concerns that market considerations were often the only or far too dominant drivers. As many have noted, too many development decisions in this city are made on a parcel-by-parcel -parcel basis, with individual projects reviewed one at a time, and with related community offsets negotiated on a one-off basis. Indeed, in an article published this fall in Architecture Boston, real estate attorney Matt Kiefer observed that in Boston, we've become dependent on private development to address more incremental needs. So the advantages of growth are unevenly distributed, and the fruits of development sometimes fall short of our civic aspirations. It should not be this way, and Boston deserves far better. Our current approach to the waterfront is not yet grounded in a larger vision. Although with Imagine Boston 2030, there are glimmers of hope. 
With bar support, the city included a focus on the waterfront in its comprehensive planning effort, the first such effort undertaken in Boston in over 50 years. I credit Mayor Walsh for his commitment and dedication to this planning work, which holds the potential to make a big difference for Boston in the years ahead. But it will only make a difference if we shift from planning to execution. At Bar, we increasingly realize that the decisions we make today have significant implications for future generations. So we wanted to find a way to shift the conversation that was happening about the waterfront and to anchor the public conversation in a larger vision. Bar's work has as its goal the realization of a great public realm throughout Boston's waterfront, one that advances five interrelated priorities. First, climate resiliency. <laughs> we are vulnerable to sea level rise, and increasingly we have more and more data that demonstrates that this is a reality for Boston. This is what the future will bring, and we must be prepared. Second, accessibility and inclusiveness. At Bar, we are concerned about a waterfront that is created for all Bostonians, not just some Bostonians. We worry about the privatization of public space, and we worry about adherence to regulations, Chapter 91, for example, which is focused on protecting the public realm along the waterfront for public use. Third, parks and open space. This is a tremendous opportunity for Boston, especially as we activate a part of the city that has been traditionally cut off by the central artery. In addition, with population growth in Boston in recent years, as well as the related development that's accompanied it, we now have larger residential communities along the waterfront who deserve great parks and open spaces to enjoy this tremendous resource. Fourth, excellent design, which is critical for any world-class city. We know from this building, from the ICA's opening over 10 years ago, designed by Dillard, Scafidio, and Renfro, that excellent design can make a difference. And we also know we have much more work to do in this regard. Indeed, Pulitzer Prize winning architecture critic Robert Campbell has written about the seaport that, quote, it is a serious failure of urban design, close quote. Fifth, mobility. There is a great opportunity to re-envision the use of the waterfront for water transportation and to think about the related climate benefits that can result from using water transport as a means of moving people around the city. Indeed, many groups have spoken to the importance of this. We are funding work with Boston Harbor Now to explore multiple options. The Pioneer Institute has come out with a study focusing on the importance of water transportation. And indeed, Globe columnist Dante Ramos recently observed that support for water transportation cuts across all ideological lines, leading to the promise that its full potential may well become a reality. So we have now been at this work for about 18 months at the Bar Foundation. And so what have we learned? I want to share a few lessons that I believe are relevant for any of us working on public realm issues. First, a long-term perspective is essential. And I want to return here to Chrissy Field in San Francisco. How many of you have been to Chrissy Field? Terrific. This is a project that was initiated with a planning grant from the Haas Jr. Fund in 1986. It finally opened in 15 years later in 2001. That kind of long-term perspective, tenacity, vision, and commitment is what is required to create this masterpiece along the public realm. 15 years later, and with $35 million of private investment, we now have a 100-acre park that is enjoyed by millions each year. Second, we must work on various dimensions simultaneously. Here I show the logo of four of the key partners for the Bar Foundation in our Waterfront Initiative. The trustees of reservations, who have been a critical partner on looking at parks and open space opportunities. Boston Harbor Now, as you know, represents the merger of two prior entities, the Boston Harbor Islands Alliance, and the Boston Harbor Association, which merged last year. Boston Harbor Now is now focused on planning, on water transportation and advocacy. 
the Conservation Law Foundation, which plays a critical role on legal protection and advocacy for the waterfront, and a more recent partner for us, Green Roots in East Boston, which is a great illustration of the need for community engagement and constituency building to promote a great waterfront. As we support all of this work, the related challenge for us is how do we ensure that all of these various parts integrate with each other so that the whole effort can be greater than the sum of its parts. Third, engaging the public is vital. Some of you may have read the recent news of Barry Diller's decision to withdraw his support from Pier 55 in New York City. This was to be a $250 million floating park on the west side of New York. A recent article in Fast Company on this topic observed, community engagement is an essential ingredient of making successful urban open space. A park designed and developed from the singular perspective of a wealthy individual bestowing a gift, no matter how well-intentioned, cannot achieve space that is truly for the people and their needs. Without community involvement, such projects can come off more like impositions on the city than additions to them. Acknowledging this important facet of our waterfront-related work, we at the Bar Foundation recently released a request for proposals earlier this summer inviting groups from across the city to submit projects for bar funding with a focus on building constituencies and advocating and activating groups of residents on waterfront related matters. We intend, we received a robust response and we intend to award grants later this year. Fourth, communications plays a critical role in this work. Perhaps one of the most important contributions that bar has made has been to help shape public understanding of the importance of this work. Our conversations about this treasured asset have been happening in the wrong way, on a parcel by parcel basis, fighting and arguing over individual projects without anchoring in a larger vision. We have to shift away from debating the merits of one project and reframing the conversation with a focus on the long term, anchored in shared values, and highlighting our aspirations. And finally, Perhaps the most important lesson has been that there is power in pushing for aspiration. In doing so, we can animate the conversation, create excitement for a new vision, and help Boston to be positioned as a leader. Indeed, I've concluded that being aspirational is vital to shaping our future public realm, one that further accentuates Boston's leadership position as a world-class city. So let's talk about aspiration and what we should be striving for in our public realm. Let me pose five questions that I believe we need to address, and I'll conclude my remarks with these five. I hope they'll stimulate conversation for us, and more importantly, I hope they prove useful to you and to the friends as you consider the key leadership role that all of you can play in promoting aspiration. First, what does public engagement with our public realm look like today? We need to consider what engagement means. And I think in doing so, we can draw inspirations from the arts field, where research has shown that in view of declining audiences, arts organizations need to reconsider how they engage their audiences. In the past, passive enjoyment of great art curated by experts was sufficient. But today, engagement must embrace a much more expansive definition that includes active engagement by the audiences themselves. In what has been a promising trend, museums and other arts organizations are experimenting with new approaches and adapting their work. There's a parallel for the public realm as well. We should not just enjoy great horticulture and beautiful design, but we must invite people to engage with our parks. This is a theme that John Allshuler touched on at, from this very podium last year, when he said the following, our parks cannot just be about lawns, flowers, and statues. It's about programming, events, people. Every citizen should want to love the space. Second, how can we nurture a culture of experimentation and risk-taking in our public realm? Here, I would cite the work of the Rose Kennedy Greenway Conservancy. This Janet Eckelman installation in 2015 represented a turning point in my mind. 
It showed that the Greenway Conservancy was unafraid to be bold and adventurous and to show what a large scale public installation, art installation, could mean for Boston. This installation drew worldwide attention, positioning Boston as a leader in promoting adventurous public art. Indeed, Sebastian Smee, I think that's Janet calling because she knows where <laughs> Indeed, Sebastian Spee, art critic for the Boston Globe, whom I've realized, by the way, is no pushover, <laughs> observed about Janet Eckelman, quote, no artist in the Boston area is working with greater ambition on a grander scale and with more impressive results, close quote. Another example of experimentation has been the aquarium's blue way concept. This bold vision reimagines reimagines the way we think about our gateway to Boston, and it repositions the harbor as Boston's front door. The Blue Way expresses an unconstrained vision, and sometimes we need to be unconstrained. For example, today's debate about the future of this entity, the Harbor Garage. Our debate today, I would contend, is a false either-or dichotomy where we are told that we can either have an ugly garage or we can have a 600-foot tower. That is a false choice. And there should be and must be other options for such a prominent space on our waterfront. Third, what are the ways that we can best activate public space? We should consider the role that art and artists can play for example, in Lynn, the Beyond Walls project is a terrific example of using art to activate public space. This is one of 15 murals that were commissioned over the last number of months and that were unveiled this summer. They represent the rich diversity of Lynn commissioned from artists from all over the world, and the result is not only beautiful, but it's created a source of civic pride and it's activated some of the more previously blighted areas in the city. Sylvia Lopez Chavez's work with the Esplanade Association is another great example of activation. Pattern behavior, which you see on the slide here, is the first public art commission by the Esplanade and it's enlivened a stretch that is used by thousands of people each day. These are powerful examples of how art can play an activation role, but we also need to think about how we bring people, programs, and activities to our parks. What partnerships can be formed to advance these ideas, and how can we demonstrate that our parks belong to everyone? Fourth, what is the impact of climate change on our parks? Last summer, the Green Ribbon Commission, a group of public, nonprofit, and private sector leaders committed to addressing climate change in Boston organized a study trip to Northern Europe. We visited Rotterdam. Mm -hmm. We wanted to learn from countries that have reframed the conversation from one that was focused on how do we combat water to one that was oriented toward how do we live with water and the reality of sea level rise. This is a reality for us in Boston, and I believe that we have opportunities to learn from other areas. We should also think about co-benefits. What do I mean by that? This park in Rotterdam serves multiple purposes. As you can see, it can be used as a basketball court. It's also used as an amphitheater for public performances. But perhaps most critically, it is a place that floods intentionally. It is a basin that holds the water when there is sea level rise and that protects the adjoining neighborhood. These kinds of co-benefits are the kind of creative and inventive approach that we need to embrace here in Boston. This image from Copenhagen shows a temporary, a temporary swimming pool that was put along the waterfront. This was an, it was an experiment for Copenhagen, and it's an experiment that, as you can see, paid off handsomely and is now part of the way they are thinking about the use of the waterfront. But we have some local examples as well. Earlier this summer, we had the groundbreaking for Martins Park on the Fort Point Channel. As many of you may know, this park, in honor of Martin Richard, the eight-year-old boy who was tragically killed in the Marathon bombing, 
will sit alongside the Children's Museum. Not only is it a wonderful amenity for people in the community, but perhaps more critically, it's being designed to be attentive to sea level rise. It's being designed, designed to absorb water, and it's being designed with the kind of height that will protect some parts of the neighborhood. But climate will not only affect waterfront parks. With increased heat, with more storms, and with other extreme weather events, all parks are affected. City Council President Michelle Wu, in a recent op-ed in WGBH, observed the following. Progress on civil rights and economic opportunity is inextricably linked with climate change. Addressing the disparate impacts of climate change requires consciously addressing the underlying social, racial, and economic inequalities embedded in our city, together as a community. This is a critical observation because it gives us the opportunity to engage all Bostonians in a conversation about the future of our public realm. And finally, if any of these ideas hold merit, where do we go from here? As I noted earlier from the Fast Company article, it's a given that public engagement is essential. This is a role that all of you played earlier this year with the Winthrop Square uh, debacle, and some would say, uh, and the controversy that came from it. And as Liz noted, certainly there were many benefits to be realized from that. But it showed the power of advocacy and engagement in confronting an important issue. We also need to invest and frankly demand that our public officials confront the hard choices that will enable us to aspire. Returning to Matt Kiefer's article, as he reflects upon the seaport, he observes, crucially, there was no public funding for the plan's open space and cultural amenities. These were expected to result from development exactions. And perhaps more critically, he adds, but the real lesson is that the seaport is the best we're likely to get when we rely on private development to pay not only for itself, but also the local armature of streets, sidewalks, and sewers that supports it, not to mention carrying the burden of signature open spaces and cultural amenities. Development feasibility takes precedence as it must. But I would ask, should it? Let me be clear. Development is vital to a city's economic success, but there must be a better way, and it starts with demanding a larger vision. In the end, we need to push for aspiration or it simply won't happen. As I close, I would encourage us to summon that same spirit that encouraged Frederick, Frederick Law Olmsted to design a comprehensive park system that could link open space in Boston. While the grand vision of the emerald necklace, which you see here, has yet to be fully realized, what Olmsted designed and what continues to generate enthusiasm in the ensuing decades is something that's aspirational. We're the beneficiaries of that vision today. It was bold, it represented making hard choices, and it required investment. The opportunity for Friends of the Public Garden today and what all of you represent is what can happen when people come together around common cause and aim to make a difference. We have to harness that same energy and commitment today more than ever. And we at the Bar Foundation look forward to being constructive partners with all of you in advancing ideas that will ensure a great public realm for Boston for decades to come. Thank you very much. for a few questions, so I'd be happy to field uh, questions if you have them. Please, and just, can you tell us who you are? Yes, of course. Uh, my name is Beatrice Nesson. I happen to be a board member. And um, I just want to say that I think that the
revenue from the sale of the project and share of the condominiums. The only thing we got out of that <coughs> legislation was a commitment to a master plan for downtown. That master plan should have been done 10 years ago so that we don't face every time a one-off. And the question I have is how do we beat that? You know, the developer, the market's hot, the developers <coughs> want to make their impacts. The mayor support it, the BPDA supports it, and there's no planning armature. And then, like the seaport, it will be too late. So I, I, I think it would be great if we could get the city agency, planning agency, via planning agency, we could get the mayor to think big and turn down a tempting project but we've never been successful to do that. So one of the interesting things, thank you for the for the question, the observation and the question, because one of the things that I would note coming from having come from San Francisco and that I learned is that Boston is quite unique mm -hmm. in having an entity in the BPDA, formerly BRA, where both planning and development reside in the same agency. They not only reside in the same agency, but they happen to be an agency that is significantly controlled by a strong mayor, regardless of who the mayor may be. So that creates a whole system of incentives and processes, as obviously Councilmember Zakem knows very well, that make this a real challenge. What I would observe, though, is when the public is mobilized, when people speak out, when institutions that have some power and authority in the city are willing to stand up and ask some of these harder questions, people do notice. And I think that the role that all of you played in the Winthrop Square conversation was a critical role. Now, maybe you didn't get everything that you might have hoped for, but the reality is having the Friends of the Public Garden stand up and be a voice and frankly be a contrary voice was absolutely important. And sometimes, even the Boston Globe has taken the position, they've actually been quite an advocate on some of these waterfront-related issues and raising some of these questions. And I think people at City Hall pay attention to what's written in the Globe. So I would just say that I think a big part of it is what I'm trying to summon all of us to do here tonight, which is we need to be much more of a voice. And we need to advocate, we need to build constituencies, and we need to be willing to stand up for these very issues because we have a structure and process and system in place that is going to be very difficult to change without that kind of advocacy. Yes, in the back. Uh, my name is Renata from Schroner, and I applaud the Bar Foundation and the emphasis on public spaces and the waterfront. And, I hope you and know, we thank you for your leadership on the Charles River Conservancy. And I hope you include not only the Charles, but I would like you to add one of the points to the five points and that is to look at transportation issues. Um, we are having 100 acres on the Charles River, right uh, across from Magazine Beach, a big transportation project, which right now cuts off neighborhoods from the river, neighborhoods from each other, and there's a wonderful opportunity to create green space and to replace the railroad tracks with green space. So I hope you will extend your advocacy to the Charles River and to the I-90 project. Thank you. That's the question. Uh, yes. Uh, Dick Wharton, uh, city planning is not a new field. Obviously, it's been around for a long time. I, 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 go through, I go through the seaport district. It is, you all know this. It is so sterile. The transportation is so poorly planned. The lack of green, dot, 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 dot. Not, I don't want to blame anybody specifically, but can we affix blame for the process that led to it being developed the way it has been? That is, why was there no, no, no thought in advance of having parks, for instance, in the area, or, or having a, a more functional transportation system? I'm sure there are others who can speak to the history of, of what happened in the seaport. What I would observe, though, is let's fast forward to the present and say, what are the opportunities today? So one of the opportunities today is, as many of you, if you have followed this, and this gets a little wonky there, has been a multi-year process for something called the Downtown Municipal Harbor Plan, which is a plan that the city has to submit to the state um, in order to account for certain zoning um, 
for certain zoning decisions that need to be made. And many of you know, because there's obviously been a lot of press about it, and I've discussed it in my comments, a lot of the focus is centered on the Shafaro development and what happens with the Harbor Garage. But the reality is that is just one development in what is a downtown municipal harbor plan. That process spanned several years. It's a process where many people who were involved in it would claim was really not much of a process at all. And indeed, the process right now is in a bit of suspended animation because it sits awaiting some agreement between the aquarium and the developer of Harbor Garage to come to a set of agreements that need to be come to before the city will fully, or the city has advanced it, but before the state will act on it. I actually think there's an opportunity here. Um, there's an opportunity to say that was a process that was started four years ago. We know a whole lot more about climate data and sea level rise in that district. We have different visions for what can be done to a place that I would argue is the gateway to Boston. And to build a 600-foot tower on the gateway to Boston, a tower that is 200 feet taller than the two towers that sit in that harbor, um, in those harbor towers, um, to build that when you're talking about the gateway to your city, to a world-class city, I would argue is something that is not at all what we should be aspiring to. So I would say there's a huge opportunity for us to call for that process to be reconsidered and for that entire municipal harbor plan to be reconsidered and to think about how you can connect, say, from Rose Wharf all the way to Christopher Columbus Park, which is an area that also is vulnerable to flooding and is going to flood downtown and the north end if something is not done about it. So there's a huge opportunity there, and the question is, do we have the political will to take a step back and tackle what could be a huge aspirational visionary legacy project for a mayor that's willing to take that on. Any other questions? So because it's 7.30 and I know, uh, I know reception awaits, let me just close. May I close with one final observation? Many of you may have seen yesterday's special section in the Boston Globe, uh, which was hashtag Dear Jeff. Uh, it was a piece where several columnists and reporters from the Globe offered a collective vision for what Amazon could bring to Boston if it decided to put its second headquarters here. Indeed, the Amazon bid, as you know, has been a topic of great urgency at both City Hall and the State House, as Boston and the Commonwealth explore how to make the region attractive to Amazon for what they call HQ2. It's hard to go a day without hearing or reading something about Amazon. But here's what I find instructive about this. Much as with the Olympics in 2015, we find again that an externality is what seems to create urgency around a bigger vision and a willingness to expend political capital to address some of our region's long-standing challenges, whether in transportation, education, or climate change, just to name a few. The challenge before us, and I believe all of us in this room have a role to play, is to ensure that regardless of what happens with Amazon, we sustain this urgency. The ideas that we're going to see promoted about how to make Boston more appealing to Amazon are worthy of pursuit regardless of whether Amazon comes here or not. For a city of our stature, it should not require an externality to improve our circumstance. And as I said at the outset, only if we are willing to embrace aspiration are we going to realize the full potential of a world-class city. Let's hope we're up to it, and let's all pledge to do our part to make it so. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Jim. You challenged us, you enlightened us, and we are not going to go back to where we were before. We are going to keep on going, and all of you, just let, let, let us know that we are not going to go back to uh, a quiet organization. We're going to be a strong organization. We've always been strong. We're going to stay motivated, stay assertive, and challenge the powers that be, because that's what it takes to get this work done. It was great for you to reaffirm that commitment that we have to that, so thank you so much. Um, now it's time to have a reception, so we welcome you all to our adjoining room for refreshments and conversation. Thank you.